I'm sorry this video is so late. I had a huge amount of problems trying to get it simple enough. So it's not turned out the way I wanted, but um, I hope you can make sense of what I've cobbled together. I'm only going to be talking about the two new components, two new ingredients, the ALC0315 and the ALC0159. I'm going to start by explaining how you read them. I expect you have copied and pasted the 4 hydroxyl butyl bis hexane 61 dil bis 2 hexyl decanoate into, I can't believe I said that, into a search engine. And you've probably come back to the COVID vaccine without any explanation about what these things mean. And the reason for that is, this is a brand new combination of components. They've never been used before as we've been told, so you won't find them. And whatever you do, don't try to search for them individually. For example, don't type in 4-hydroxybutyl because butyl comes from butane, which at room temperature, as you know, is a highly flammable gas, but it's not a highly flammable component. I'll try to explain it as simply as I can. Let's say that ALC0315 is a cake and the bits inside are eggs butter and sugar you wouldn't say you sat down this afternoon with a nice cup of tea and a bowl of eggs half a pound of sugar and a pat of butter because that wouldn't be true you had a cake you wouldn't list the ingredients that just wouldn't make sense and it's exactly the same with chemistry you can't look at these bits as individuals you have to look at them as a whole Starting with ALC0315, everything within that ingredient is ionizable, which means it can be given a positive charge. The RNA has a negative charge, which means it's attracted, it sticks together with the, the, the contents in 0315. It's a bit like magnetism, okay, it's a different science, but opposites attract. And it's important for this vaccine because you don't want the components splitting apart once it's inside you. That causes a whole load of troubles. So positive and negative charge is so they stick together. If you want to see the chemistry behind those ingredients, you have to convert it into a chemical formula. You can't search for the individual parts. As I said, that doesn't work. You have to search for ALC0315. And if you do, you'll get the above formula. If you look towards the bottom of that, underneath where it says properties, you'll see C48H95NO5. And that means it has 48 parts carbon, 95 parts hydrogen and nitric pentoxide. It's the NO with the five. It's just called pentoxide, pent for five. That's as far as I'm going to go into detail regarding chemical formulae because it gets really complicated. I've left several links in the description which explain in much more detail what this means, but I don't want to go into full-blown chemistry teacher mode because we'll be here all night. So if you're interested, just go and click on some of the links in the description. I tried without luck for way longer than I should have to try and find this part, the ALC0315, in the clinical trials. I wanted to find out perhaps why they chose this combination of lipids to go into the vaccine, but I didn't have any luck and I couldn't shed any light onto why they chose these components. Moving on to ALC0159. This is the ingredient that bothers me the most. It contains polyethylene glycol 2000, otherwise known as PEG or, or PEGliation. And that's the word I'll be using quite a lot in the next part of the video. The 2000 is just the weight. PEGs come in all different weights for different types of medicines, medications. And this one is just 2000. It's not the highest number available, I think it goes up to 44,000, but 2,000 is in this vaccine. So why do pegs bother me so much? Well, if you remember, just a few days after the vaccine rollout, 
it was reported in the press that several people who had received the vaccine had had allergic reactions to it, and some of it quite serious. Not quite anaphylaxis, but along those lines, and it's widely thought it was due to the pegs. I find it utterly baffling as to why they decided to put this peg into the vaccine. I found this article, it was published on the 2nd of February this year, 2020, and it starts off by saying that the pegs are widely used in nano medicine. But a few lines down, it says, however, it is increasingly recognized that treating patients with pegliated drugs that can lead to the formation of antibodies, which is what this vaccine is aimed to do, that specifically recognize and bind to PEG, i.e. anti-PEG antibodies. Anti-PEG antibodies are also found in patients who have never been treated with pegliated drugs, but have consumed products containing PEG. Consequently, treating patients who have acquired anti-PEG antibodies with pegliated drugs result in accelerated blood clearance, low drug efficiency, hypersensitivity, and in some cases, life-threatening side effects. In this succinct review, we collate recent literature to draw attention of polymer chemists to the issue of PEG immunogenicity in drug delivery and bioconjugation, thereby highlighting the importance of developing alternative polymers to replace PEG. As it happens, there is an alternative. There was a study that took place in Vistar rats, never in humans, but then this vaccine hasn't been used in humans prior to the trials. It was used in rats to test the vaccine to see if the vaccine delivery was just as good as with pegliated lipids. And the conclusion was yes, they were very similar outcomes. The key word here is vaccine. Non-pegliated lipids can be used in vaccine delivery, but only pegliated lipids are used for gene editing. So I decided it was worth looking a little deeper into BioNTech and Pfizer to see if they actually had anything to do with gene editing. And the results were quite surprising. En route to finding the answer, I came across this article explains that Pfizer and BioNTech are actually using the technology discovered by a small Canadian pharmaceutical company called Acutas. Now I don't know if I'm just being a bit picky over language, but I'll read you the paragraph. It says, we all had already been working with BioNTech prior to this COVID-19 vaccine. So when the pandemic hit, they recognized that our technology, technology could be used to help them develop a vaccine. We began discussions with them in January and then we flew to Germany in early February to meet the German regulatory authorities as well as BioNTech to map out the clinical program necessary to support a COVID-19 vaccine candidate. Listen to that, that first line. So when the pandemic hit, well, that was December the 31st last year, I believe. And I understand that to mean in the, in the next few days, they realized that the technology could be used in a vaccine. Well, how on earth could they have known that a vaccine would be necessary for something which by, which on the 31st of December has only affected people in one family. That was where it was, that's where how it was discovered it was a family in China. How could they possibly have known this was going to be a pandemic? If we continue reading down to almost at the bottom of the article, we can see that Acuitas is open to collaborations with non-government entities like the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. While we're on the subject of the Gates Foundation, I want to draw your attention to this article. It's from the 26th of January, which seems to be one of the key dates in this COVID story. Lots of things have happened on the 26th of January. I haven't got time to go into them now, but I want to draw your attention to this article. January, and it says on the bottom paragraph, 
The Foundation is also immediately committing $5 million to assist the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in scaling up public, public health measures against COVID-19 among African Union member states. These measures will include technical support to implement the screening and treatment of suspected cases, laboratory confirmation of COVID-19 diagnoses and the safe isolation and care of identified cases. But Mr Gates may have wasted his money. If we look at this article in the, in the Lancet, it says at the bottom, Africa confirmed its first case in Egypt on the 14th of February 2020. So that asks the question, why on earth did he send all this money to Africa to help with the Covid crisis when there hadn't even been any cases? Look at the deaths in Africa in 2018. I can't look for 2019 because it just comes up with Covid because the 19's in it. It says, despite remarkable progress, 15,000 children and 800 women still die every day, mostly of preventable or treatable causes. Now I've done some maths, 15,800 women times 365 comes to the grand total of 5,767,000. That's an enormous amount. This is the number of COVID-19 deaths in Africa up to the 14th of December. The total for the whole of Africa is the grey line at the top and it says 56,740. That's in the whole of Africa. The amount of dollars the Gates Foundation has thrown at COVID-19 vaccine project recently, it totals $680 million. And this is for a virus that has shown, as of yesterday, 28th of December, 2.1% deaths, leaving, making that a 97.9 survival rate. It just doesn't make any sense. So back to looking at these companies. I quickly discovered that Acutas, Pfizer and BioNTech all have active or in the pipeline gene editing programs. And these are different to gene therapies, which is what our vaccine is. Gene editing is actually changing the genetic information by either insertion or deletion of a gene. Probably really confused now because in my previous video, I said that I didn't think this was about genetic editing because I couldn't think of a reason why they would want to change the genetic information of the over 80s. I just couldn't work it out. Why start with them and not the young people? If they wanted to reduce the population, you'd interfere with their fertility. So I couldn't think of a reason. And if I can't think of a reason, I can't go with that idea. And someone commented under that video and said, well, what if different age groups were getting different vaccines? And that was an excellent point. It had crossed my mind fleetingly and it came into my head and it went out of my head. I didn't consider it at all. But this person has a point. What if the vaccines are targeting genes for different age groups? As far as I'm aware, any gene can be edited, including the brain. And a batty thought crossed my mind. What if this vaccine were able to edit something in the brain to change our personality. Now I've looked and it's perfectly feasible. It's a technique called RNA editing. It's, it's very, very similar to gene editing. The only difference being the RNA editing doesn't last. It's not permanent, whereas the DNA editing is. Now how handy would that be if they could edit our brains to make us more compliant towards the agenda, which, which isn't a conspiracy theory, it's a fact. Now, I know it sounds balmy, but it is feasible, I believe. So to sum up, the listing of those new lipids in the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine has opened up a whole new opinion of what's going on. Until I saw those, that peg part of the vaccine, I was convinced that genome editing had nothing to do with this vaccine because as I said before if there's no reason for it I can't even consider it but now I can 
Now I know that this technology can be used in gene editing and it looks like it's more likely than to be in a vaccine, then I'm definitely open to changing my mind. Who knows, something else might come up where I'm a bit iffy about it, but as it stands, I'd say gene editing in this vaccine is a strong possibility.